Northwestern Mutual put out an interesting survey on the US consumer and they painted a little bit more of a dire picture, which is something that's really tough to read in light of the current economic situation. And that's something that I want to go through and analyze in this video. So guys, as usual, smash that like button and subscribe if you're new. You're watching more money. Let's get it. What's up guys and welcome back to the channel where the goal here is to help at least a thousand people achieve financial independence much sooner. And guys, guess what? Today is my birthday actually. And my wife asked, what do you want to do for your birthday? And you know what? I really didn't have a good answer to that question. I have everything that I want. My wife actually says it's kind of annoying because I'm not easy to shop for. I also don't really have a desire for anything extravagant or anything like that. So I told my wife I only want two things. The first thing is I just want to make a few videos for the YouTube community. That's what really brings me a lot of happiness. And so that's really what I want to do. And so I'm going to try to release two or three videos today. The second thing that I want to do on my birthday is just go for a really nice dinner with my beautiful wife. That's it. That's all I want in this world. All right, let's get into this video. So you can see here that Northwestern Mutual put together what they call the 2022 Planning and Progress Study. And effectively, I cut out the most important chart here in their presentation. They have concluded that from their survey, which is a verbal answer, there's no third party verification, that consumers are saying that their savings have actually dropped 15% from last year. And that's very interesting because the savings rate has also dropped year over year. So now Northwestern Mutual is saying that the absolute dollar amount of savings is declining and also the US savings rate is declining, which is a tough thing to grasp in light of the current economic situation, in my opinion. Now here's something that's very interesting. They asked a few questions about the confidence in consumers and they came back with two questions which I thought were absolutely the same. So the first question is, I will have enough money for my retirement. And the second question is, I will have enough money to retire when the time comes. That's effectively the same question. However, notice how the respondents differed. For the one question, they were 74% positive. For the other one, they were 60% positive. So it's interesting to see the disparity in the results depending on how the question's asked. However, I just conclude on the bottom right there that despite a deviation in the responses to that same question, the point is that Americans still remain positive towards the economy. And I think that's very important because consumer confidence goes a long way. If you want to spiral downwards, consumer negative sentiment becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. So we don't want that in the economy, especially going into an environment with tougher economics as we've been seeing as of late. Now, when these consumers were asked about their greatest obstacles to reaching financial security in retirement, notice how people said that the inflation rate and the economy are issues number one and two. And lack of savings is obviously number three. And I think we're all generally worried about lack of savings. That'll always stay there. But it's just interesting how inflation and the economy show up as one and two. So I think as both political parties are heading into the midterm elections, those are the issues that they're going to have to address because those are the issues that I think are going to resonate most with voters. Now moving into this article that Bloomberg released, it suggests that there are cracks in the US economy that are starting to show as recession warnings mount. So notice that the expected growth rate in the fourth quarter of 2022 has declined over time. So at the beginning of the year, we expected the growth rate in the fourth quarter to be around 3% or just over 3%. And notice how we expect very little growth now. We expect one and a half percent. So less than half of the growth rate that we were expecting just five months ago. And now notice on the right that the expected level of inflation in January was around that just over two, maybe 3% area. And now we're sort of expecting that we haven't gotten a hold of inflation. And so it's looking like the expected inflation rate is still gonna be around 6%, which by all means is still lower than where it currently is. But effectively what this is saying is that we're gradually coming to the conclusion that we have not got this under control as quickly as we may have liked to have it under control. Now in that article, they had a pretty important sentence here. They're saying that consumers that are, are squeezed by higher prices for gasoline and food, American households are now taking on record amounts of debt 
to help make ends meet. And that's really scary because if you're going into an environment where we're gonna have tougher economics, there could potentially be layoffs, do you really want your population more indebted than they have ever been? And so that's a bit of a scary situation. Now I wanted to see what that record amount of debt looked like by myself. And so I jumped into the Federal Reserve Bank of New York data. And you can see here that non-housing debt is ticking up at a faster rate than housing debt. That's that red shaded area. So what's happening is credit card balances actually have declined significantly in the first year of the pandemic and remain $86 billion lower than they were at the end of 2019. So that's a really good statement. That means consumers are being a bit more prudent with their credit card spending. So that's really good. And the second sentence here, student loan balances now stand at $1.6 trillion and increased by 14 billion in the first quarter of 2022. And that makes a lot of sense. Student loan balances are gonna continue to increase in an environment where student loans don't necessarily have to get paid and there aren't really penalties for students to not pay their debt right now. And breaking up that non-housing debt balance, you can see that the fastest growing segment of that non-housing debt balance is student loans. So they have really surged in the past 18 years, which I believe is holding back an entire generation. I think millennials and generation Z are the generations that are gonna be slower to form houses, buy their first homes. I think there's serious impacts to these two generations. We've already seen it with millennials. They've pushed out marriage and having children. And I think you're just gonna see that more so with Generation Z. Now, just because the debt levels have gone up doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem right now. And so you gotta really look at the delinquency rate. So you can see here that the 90 days delinquency rates have pretty much stayed the same or declined subsequent to the pandemic. The only one that I wanna point out is the student loans delinquency rate has actually declined significantly. And that's because of the CARES Act. They just don't have to pay anything back right now. And so in the notes at the bottom here, it's saying that aggregate delinquency rates were unchanged in the first quarter of 2022 and remain very low, especially on a historical basis. Delinquency rates have been low in part due to forbearances provided by both the CARES Act and voluntarily offered by lenders, which protect borrowers' credit records from the reporting of skipped or deferred payments. And so effectively, you've had a pause on student loan payments, which remains in place. And I think that pause it remains in place until around August of this year. Correct me in the comments below if I got that date wrong. And so you can see here that although foreclosures and bankruptcies are at historic lows still, you can see that foreclosures have actually ticked up in Q1 2022. So that's something that we really gotta watch as time goes on here. And speaking to the forbearances and delinquencies in general, you can see here that the New York Fed said that although these forbearances have ended for most types of debts, the pause on student loans remains in place. The share of debt transitioning into delinquency increased modestly for nearly all debt types except student loans, although they remain very low by historic standards. Although foreclosures are very low, there was a small uptick in new foreclosures in Q1 2022. And here's a point where I was actually right. Look, you can see here that the CARES Act administrative forbearances has been extended through a August 31st of 2022. My question is, however, I wonder if we get into a situation where they perpetually have to continue to extend these student loan forbearances. I wouldn't be surprised if these get extended again past the midterm election cycle. About 91,000 consumers had a bankruptcy notation added to their credit reports in the first quarter of 2022. However, that's the lowest level since the series began in 1999. So, at the moment, it doesn't look like delinquencies and forbearances are an issue. However, we did see a small uptick. And the other thing that we gotta pay attention to is what happens to delinquencies and forbearances once that extension for the student loans expires completely. And then this raises the question of, do you just forgive student loans in general? And I think that's gonna be an election topic that's gonna come up over and over again because the current administration effectively promised that they would do so. At least that's what I think they did. Guys, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong there, but you can see here that President Biden has backed forgiveness of up to $10,000 in debt. And he's rejected the calls to waive up to $50,000. And he said, I will not make that happen, which he said at a town hall, arguing that such a move would benefit 
graduates of elite professional schools like doctors and lawyers, and I'm gonna throw accountants in there too because I'm biased, and the money would be better spent, for instance, on lowering tuition costs. And then a Trump appointee said that it's fundamentally unfair to ask two thirds of Americans who don't go to college to pay the bills for the mere one third who do. That was a quote from Donald Trump's education secretary, Betsy DeVos, which he said in a speech last year. So it looks like the federal government isn't going to do anything about student debt in a weak economy. So here's where I think it might just be easier to perpetually defer this debt. But of course, that's gonna impact lenders disproportionately. So we'll see how this progresses. Now guys, there's a ton of data points that I could potentially be missing. So please let me know in the comments below if there's any important data points that I miss that I should highlight in a future video. Also guys, I put out a ton of great content on this channel. The next video will be about the crackdown with cloud computing that's happening in China right now. And that will absolutely impact Alibaba. So in order for you guys to not miss out on that video, please take a second right now and hit that subscribe button and ring that notification bell so that you're notified when that video is uploaded. Now, the other thing that I hope you guys pay attention to is that capital is fleeing China right now and the Chinese government is looking to lock it down. And I actually talk about that in this video right here.